time for hiding is done. King Aegon II declared on Dragonstone after Sunfire had feasted on his sister. Let the ravens fly so the realm may know that the pretender is dead and their true king is coming home to reclaim his father's throne. Yet even true kings may find some things more easily proclaimed than accomplished. The moon would wax and wane and wax again before Aegon II took leave of Dragonstone. Between him and King's Landing lay the Isle of Driftmark, the whole breadth of Blackwater Bay and scores of prowling Valarian warships, with the sea snake a guest of Tristane Truefire in King's Landing and Sir Adam dead at Tumbleton, command of the Valarian fleet now rested with Adam's brother, Alan, the younger son of Mouse, the shipwright's daughter, a boy of 15, but would he be a friend or foe? His brother had died fighting for the queen, but that same queen had made their lord a captive and was herself dead. Ravens were dispatched to Driftmark, offering House Valarian pardon for all its past offences if Alan of Hull would present himself on Dragonstone and swear allegiances. But until and unless an answer was received, it would be a folly for Aegon II to try and cross Blackwater Bay by ship and risk his capture. Nor did his grace wish to sail to King's Landing. The days following his half-sister's death, the king still clung on to the hope that the Sunfire might recover enough strength to fly again. Instead, the dragon only seemed to weaken further, and soon the wound on his neck began to stink. Even the smoke he exhaled had a foul smell to it and towards the end, he would no longer eat. On the ninth day of the twelfth moon of 130 AC, the magnificent golden dragon that had been King Aegon's glory died in the outer yard of Dragonstone where he had fallen. His grace wept and gave orders that his cousin, Lady Baylor, be brought up from the dungeons and put to death. Only when her head was on the block did he repent. When his maester reminded him that the girl's mother had been a Valarian, a sea snake's own daughter, Another raven took wing for Driftmark, this time with a threat. Lest Alan of Hull present himself within a fortnight to do homage to his rightful liege, his cousin, the Lady Baylor, would lose her head. On the western shore of Blackwater's Bay, meanwhile, the moon of the three kings came to a sudden end when an army appeared outside the walls of King's Landing. For more than half a year, the city had lived in fear of Ormond Hightower's advancing coast. But when the assault came, it came not from the Old Town, by way of Bitterbridge and Tumbleton, but from the King's Road from Storm's End. Boris Brathian, on hearing of the Queen's death, had left his newly pregnant wife and four daughters to strike north through the Kingswood with 600 knights and 4,000 on foot. When the Brathian vanguard was seen across the Blackwater Rush, the shepherd commanded his followers to rush the river to keep Lord Boris from coming ashore, but only 100 came to listen to this beggar who had once preached to tens of thousands, and few obeyed. Atop Aegon's high hill, the squire, now calling himself King Tristane Truefire, stood on the battlements of Lara Strong and Sir Perkin the Flea, gazing at the swelling ranks of the Stormlanders. We do not have the strength to oppose such a host, sire, Lord Laris told the boy, but perhaps words can succeed where swords must fail. Send me to parley with them. And so the clubfoot was dispatched across the river under a flag of truce accompanied by Grand Maester Orwell and the Dowager Queen Alicent. The Lord of Storm's End received them in a pavilion on the edge of the Kingswood, as his men felled trees to build rafts for the river crossing. There, Queen Alicent received the glad news that her granddaughter, Jehera, the only surviving child of her son Aegon and daughter Helena, had been delivered safely to Storm's End by Sir Willis Fell of the Kingsguard. The Dowager Queen wept tears of joy. Betrayals and betrothals followed and so a cord was reached between Lord Boris, Lord Laris, and Queen Alicent, with Grand Maester Orwell as witness. The club would promise that Sir Perkin and his gutter knights would join the Stormlanders in restoring King Aegon II to the Iron Throne, on the condition that all of them, save the pretender Tristane, would be pardoned for any and all offences, including high treason, rebellion, robbery, murder, and rape. Queen Alicent agreed that her son, King Aegon, would make Lady Cassandra, Boris's eldest daughter, his new queen. Lady Flores, another of his lordship's daughters, was to be betrothed to Lara Strong. The problem posed by the Valarian fleet was discussed at some length. We must bring the sea snake into this, Lord Baratheon is reported to have said. Perhaps the old man would like a new young wife. I have two daughters not yet spoken for. He's a traitor thrice over, Queen Alicent said. Rhaenyra could have never taken King's Landing but for him. His grace, my son, will not have forgotten. I want him dead. He 
He will die soon enough in any case, replied Lord Larry Strong. Let us make our peace with him now and make what use of him we can. Once all is safely settled, if we have no further need of House Valarian, we could always lend the stranger a hand. And so it was agreed. Most shamefully, the envoys returned to King's Landing and the Stormlanders soon followed, crossing the Blackwater Rush without incident. Lord Boris found the city walls unmanned, the gates undefended, the streets and squares empty, save for corpses. As he climbed Aegon's high hill with his banner bearer and household shields, he saw the ragged banner of the squire, Tristane, hauled down from the gatehouse battlements, and the golden dragon banner of King Aegon II raised in its stead. Queen Alice and herself emerged from the Red Keep to bid him welcome, with Sir Perkin the Flea beside her. Where is the pretender? Lord Boris asked, as he dismounted in the outer ward. Taken in chains, replied Sir Perkin. 